All right, so our next speaker is Christian Beaulieu. Is it right? I think so. Uh, from the Peter S. Allen MRI Research Institute. I'm going to try to stand over here on the side so I don't get a crowded dissection during the talk. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dunn and the organizers for um, inviting me uh, as an outsider because uh, I haven't been to any of the conferences that she had in circles except o OHBM and even that one it's been three years. So thank you. And what I'd like to do today is uh, talk to you a bit about um, the basics of diffusion tensor imaging, which um, some of you may or may not know, know about, and how we could use it to learn a bit more about white matter. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about diffusion basics, because as I said, not everyone here may be familiar with it. I'm going to talk a bit about some older work on whole track development, um, and then talk about some newer work that's kind of hot off the presses by my postdoc, about a, looking at along the tracks, instead of assuming that the entire tract is behaving the same, looking at the networked brain, and then just wrapping up. All right, so what is it about a random uh, and not, not coherently flowing or flux water molecule that makes it interesting from the point of view of learning something about the human brain? Well, what we'd like to be able to do is we have the images uh, on the left where you have the arcuate fasciculus, You've got maps of fractional anisotropy, which I'll talk about in a second, that highlight the white matter. So we have a way to evaluate uh, and identify these tracks in vivo, and then also to pr pr put a number on the various white matter regions to try to quantify something. And what is it we want to quantify? We want to qu quantify something about axonal membrane, <laughs> about myelin density, about axon packing, the coherence of the wiring, um, and so on. And so the hope is that we need a microscope to do this. Well, our microscope is an MRI scanner, and the hope is that we can link these two things together. Now, how do we get from microscopic water diffusion to brain wiring? Well, it turns out that water diffusion is anisotropic. It means it goes more along the direction of the axons than perpendicular. And if you measure those millions of water molecules in a voxel, which was represented by that little red square, and you take the primary diffusion direction and connect the dots, then you start to have tractography, which is the ability to now extract a particular white matter streamline or a white matter tract. And in this case, um, as we zoom out, we have the genu of the corpus callosum of my former PhD student, Luis Concha. So while we're measuring things on the micron stage, we're able to get all the way to tracks. The important thing to remember is it works the other way around as well. So here's a fractional anisotropy map, or FA map. That's what we're going to be primarily uh, talking about as our main white matter metric today. And if it's black, then it means that the FA is zero. It's isotropic, water's moving randomly in all directions equally, and it appears black like the CSF does in that brain. If it's white, then the FA is one at maximum, or I, uh, more realistically, a value in between, probably around 0.4 to 0.7, and that reflects that the water is moving uh, faster in one direction than another. And even though our resolution in this type of imaging is very, very coarse, maybe two by two millimeter in plane, two to five millimeter slices, depending on what you're doing, remember that we are, the intensity that you're getting or the number that you're getting in that voxel is reflective of what's happening at the microscopic scale. Diffusion imaging is measuring water motions on the order of five to 10 microns. And it's those millions of water molecules that are interacting with these, whoops, with these uh, uh, membranes, myelin, et cetera, et cetera, that's moving around and interacting. It's those indirect effects that we're measuring and are attributing. Uh, so you, there is a link between the FA and the underlying microstructure. Now there's more to DTI than just FA alone. There's parallel diffusivity, perpendicular diffusivity, mean diffusivity. We're not gonna talk about that in this short talk today. One of the key things I'd like to point out is that you have to compare apples to apples. These diffusion metrics are not specific and uh, one can't compare the FA of uh, optic radiation and FA of a cortical spinal tract and start saying that one's got more myelin or has greater axon packing than the other. But it is okay to compare apples to apples, and if you're looking at a patient study versus controls, or in our case, as a function of age, 
and that's perfectly acceptable. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the first study, the studies that I want to talk about is just where we were. And this was looking at whole tract uh, development. So assuming that the entire tract that you depict with tractography is actually um, behaving the same. It's an easy way to begin with, uh, especially given the amount of numbers one would generate otherwise. Now, one thing to keep in mind though, is that uh, we don't usually put this in papers. You know, FA was measured in the voxels identified with this tractography algorithm on this protocol with this SNR. With where, and it corresponds to where the cingulum ought to be given a priori knowledge, right? We say that FA was measured in the cingulum, <laughs> all right? But it's important to keep in mind that if you change your thresholds, you use a different algorithm, you have different seal and noise, your image quality is poor, whatever it is, you're not going to track the same track that somebody else is going to track. Um, and uh, you're going to get parts of other tracks, there's crossing fibers. But we have to simplify in order to be able to make these measurements, but one needs to be aware that that's the case. So five years ago now, um, Catherine Rebell looked at 202 healthy people aged 5 to 30 years, and what was the insight um, on white matter from the DTI? Well, she found that there was a bunch of tracks that were mostly developed by about 13 years of age, where they went up very quickly and then kind of leveled off. There was a bunch of tracks that kind of mostly developed by 18 to 22 years. And then there was a bunch that were still going up in the 20s. And that was mostly the two temporal frontal tracks, the cingulum and the uncinate fasciculus. And so showing that there was some unique, interesting white matter timing changes in, in uh, brain development. And if you make a developmental timing profile and where you plot at what age the, the, uh, that track reached 95% of its maximum uh, anisotropy, or FA, then you get a bunch of tracks uh, like here that are uh, rapidly developing. You have a bunch that are in the middle, and then you have those few that continue to develop uh, into the 20s. And the hot colors represent larger changes. So not only do the tracks uh, mature at different times, then they're also changing by different amounts. So you can see that the genu and the body of the corpus callosum are kind of colder colors. They don't change as much as the cingulum, which is, uh, can change by as much as 20% from age 5 to 30 years. Now, those are cross-sectional studies, and there's lots to be learned from longitudinal studies as well. And these are two FA maps of the same person at 6 and 10 years. And what's nice is we can quantify some of the changes. And uh, what Catherine did next was look at these, these scans were about four years apart on average, and we have 221 scans and 100 and healthy, 103 healthy people. And if you look at it and say, okay, who's FA increased in a specific track between these four years? Those are in green. Who didn't change? That's in blue. And who went down? That's in red, based on some a priori thresholds. Then you can see that there's lots of people that go up in the cortical spinal tract at the younger ages like you would expect. Not everyone. And then that tapers off, and then the declines also uh, increase. If you look at a track like the inferior frontal occipital track, that shows something really interesting. Even into the 20s, about 40% of the individuals were still increasing their anisotropy. Yet there was a bunch that were not changing, and some that were actually decreasing. So there's variability in white matter development, while we think would be very interesting as well um, as a uh, corollary to seeing how brain function or disease progression occurs. So that's the old stuff. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today uh, in the next few minutes is work done by Dr. Zhang Chen, my postdoctoral fellow. And um, the first one will be along the tracks. So what we've assumed before is that the entire track would behave the same. And a lot of that was to simplify things. Um, but we've never really had a success with correlating those FA values in those whole tracks with various cognitive functions. It's just never really worked out as nicely as we would hope. And that's why people use a lot of voxel-based type of analyses and find portions of areas of the brain that seem to correlate with cognition, but not in a whole tract, where, where you might expect a whole tract to, to uh, correlate. And so in, these are just a couple of examples of methods used uh, that, that were reported in, in 2005 of how can you measure a variation of this FA parameter along a tract. And one example here was in the cingulum where you looked at the arc angle um, and showed 
for example, that uh, the FA was not consistent along the length of the cingulum, and in fact, there was a, an asymmetry where the left side was higher than the right. That's blue over the red. Um, or you could uh, look at the, um, this is the PASTA method by Derek Jones, where you just start at one end of the tract and continue on along, and then plot the FA as a function of the length. And then you make everybody's same tract the same length in order to compare them. And there's lots of other methods as well that have been published in the literature. And people are starting to get interested in looking at this type of analysis as a function of age. Um, so here we have uh, one to two years of age where you have increases um, in the two-year-olds relative to the one-year-olds. Here's the arcuate fasciculus where uh, this is FA along the length of the arcuate. Um, and you can see that it's just the central portion here that seems to be showing a change with age. And then here's uh, an aging study where the front part of these white matter tracts, which are represented like little tubes, um, if they're red, they're um, higher, much higher FA than the older subjects, whereas if they're yellow, they're not quite as high. So clearly, there's variability along the tracts, and our initial assumption that the whole tract should behave the same um, was probably incorrect. So the model that we used was one that was developed by Paul Yushkovich, and this is in collaboration with Gary Zhang at UC London, um, where one uses a, uh, does tractography on a template, a population-derived template, and you get these like little sheets, and then what you do is you then um, measure your FA on those various sheets and, uh, and compare your, your population. And these are uh, some examples of two of the tracks that I want to talk to you today about, um, which is the corpus callosum and one's the SLF. And you can see that you have all these nice little vertices where you can then do statistics to compare your different uh, uh, individuals. So what we looked at was our population of healthy subjects, in this case 171 subjects, aged 6 to 30, um, but equivalent male and female. And what we did is generate a population-specific template and then we do tractography of 14 major tracts in that template itself. Um, I'm just going to talk about two of the tracts today. Uh, and then you do a medial service representation of that tract, align all your subjects to that template, and then you measure the FA of each vertex, because you have to put everybody in the same space in order to be able to compare along, uh, across the tract. And this is just uh, the method we use. And then we fit with an exponential, did an FDR correction, and to see which ones changed, which vertices changed as a function of age. Now, the first thing we did is just made sure that if we look at the, all the vertices over the whole representation, that we get similar results to our tractography uh, results from before. And yes, we see rapid, intermediate, and slow tracks where you see uh, different elevations in FA, in, uh, but we didn't see much gender differences. What about the tract specific analysis? And this is the corpus callosum. So we have a left view and a right view uh, here. And the areas that are colored are areas that showed an exponential increase with age. Areas that don't, aren't colored didn't show that increase. And you can see, uh, just from this one, that not all the uh, vertices um, show a change. And the ones that do show a change show different colors, where the color represents the change in FA per year. Some areas are hot, others are cold. If you look at the age at the maximum FA, you can see that most of the tracts, a lot of the regions of the tract develop before the age of 10, um, but there are some regions that are into the teens. If you look again at, at the SLF, um, and, and the top one is the left SLF and the bottom one's the right, you can see again that not all the vertices are behaving the same. They don't, don't show the exponential increase and they show different amounts of change. In this case, the more posterior part here shows a bigger uh, change, likely a more rapid increase early on. If you look at the maximum age, uh, or the age at maximum FA, again, you can see that the posterior part here shows a, whoops, sorry, shows a uh, blue, so developed by age 10, whereas this frontal part here isn't until the teens. All right, so there's some variability along the tract, I think is the, the main point. The other thing is we were just talking about gender is it appears that there's a gender influence as well. And we never really picked this out in our whole tract analysis where the females seem to be changing more over a larger part of the tract and uh, doing it earlier. So that's kind of interesting and fits very nicely with the talk we just heard. Okay, can you click on the movie? No, 
go back. You have to click on the movie. No, just do the slideshow. Leave it in slideshow mode and then just click on it. There we go. That's fine. So what we're seeing here is just a pictorial representation of where the color codes the FA and the idea that um, what we're seeing is, is a sliding window of the mean FA as a function of age. And you see the different parts of the tract are kind of getting hotter at different times. Right? So not only is there, are there FA differences across the tract, as we already know, but they're coming in at different times. Right? So I think this will be a powerful approach to investigate this in the future. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the networked brain. And if anybody has any questions about network analysis, I'll forward them to him, because he's the network uh, expert, not me. Um, the idea is that we can map out the brain's network, uh, and we identify a bunch of hubs in the brain using whatever template you like, use tractography to find out which hubs are connected to one another, come up with a uh, matrix um, of all the different regions versus all the other regions, and then uh, put a little square where there's a connection. And then one can do some graph theoretical analysis and come up with some various network parameters. And people have started to do this in terms of studying development with diffusion tensor imaging. There's studies on infants, there's studies on um, during adolescence and early childhood, and there's studies on adolescence to young adulthood. And so we're interested in investigating this kind of um, exciting new area as well. And it turns out that Dr. Zhang Chen is an expert in network analysis. He comes from Alan Evans' lab from uh, the MNI and uh, using, doing cortical thickness analysis and now wanted to try his hand at uh, DTI analysis. And so what we did is broke the group into th five groups of subjects, 36 subjects each. And we have early childhood, which was 6 to 9, late childhood 10 to 12, adolescence 13 to 17, 18 to 21 for young adults, and 22 to 30 for adults. We constructed the network and then we did some group comparisons. And we created these um, matrices, as I showed earlier, and showed that the small world network, which is a property of this network, was maintained over all the different uh, age groups. In addition, one can look at a bunch of different metrics and uh, one's head starts to hurt after a while when you start seeing the number of metrics that can come out. But here's a couple of them. And one's a global network efficiency, which actually interestingly goes up um, here between early and late childhood and then stays pretty flat after that. And modularity, uh, which goes down between early childhood and late childhood and then stays pretty flat. And the idea is that you improve the efficiency over longer distances, uh, close local regions become less interconnected, the brain's becoming a bit more randomized. And it seems from our data that the early to late uh, childhood seems to be the key stage for this white matter architecture change. What's interesting is that the hub regions that are identified in each of those groups remain consistent from early childhood to adulthood. I mean, these pictures are pretty much identical. But it doesn't mean that the regions themselves aren't changing, and there's regional efficiency changes that occur, and uh, some of the usual suspects that appear in these network studies appear in ours as well, including the precuneus and some uh, orbital frontal regions. All right, so those are some areas that I believe are going to uh, shed some light into um, uh, the developing brain, and are it still works in progress. And another work in progress that we're working on is the idea of high definition, or HD DTI. Um, if one has access to a high field MRI scanner, we don't have a 7 Tesla, we have a 4.7 Tesla. There's only, uh, one, uh, there's only two in the world for humans, the other one's in Japan. And one can take advantage of the greater signal to noise that one gets to start uh, getting much higher re spatial resolution. A lot of other groups are focusing on more complex post-processing algorithms. We're focusing more on the acquisition side of things. And this is a custom written uh, DTI sequence which has 1.7 millimeter isotropic resolution, 30 diffusion directions in about eight minutes for full brain and can make very nice tractography of very difficult tracks to tract such as the fornix and the cingulum. This is actually going even further to 1.5 millimeter isotropic DTI. So I think that um, this will be another avenue forward for those that have access to high field scanners and more signal to really push, push our measurements uh, to the limit um, of these white matter tracks. 
So just to finish up, um, diffusion parameters are not very specific, but they can detect unique timing changes of the white matter that have been associated with development, and they seem to make sense. I haven't talked about links to cognition because there just wasn't any, uh, any time, but there's uh, lots of stuff at this meeting discussing that. Um, the along the tract analysis also shows that not the whole tract, the whole tract doesn't behave the same. And I think there's a lot of work to be done there, and maybe that will pull out some of these elusive cognitive correlations. Network analysis is uh, still emerging and provides global measures of white matter changes instead of just region by region, and it seems that early to late childhood had the biggest change. And finally, that there's a lot of advances going forward in terms of diffusion acquisition, in terms of the protocols, and in terms of the analyses. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zhang Chen in particular for uh, the work that he did on this uh, presentation, as well as our collaborators, some former students uh, who really uh, got the neuro neurodevelopment ball started uh, rolling. And, um, and as a plug, uh, the, the first diffusion workshop in eight diffusion MRI workshop in eight years is happening in three weeks in Croatia, where diffusion is being used as a probe of neural tissue microstructure. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.